Well, good afternoon, financial professionals. I'm Dan Peterson. I'm president and managing partner here at E4 Insurance Services, and I'm privileged to be welcoming you to The Brew, building relationships every week. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, for those of you joining The Brew for the first time, we welcome you. We'd like to start the Brewcast by celebrating today's national day, as our tradition is. Today is National Basketball Day. Uh, today is also National Nacho Day. So break out those nachos, jalapenos, and, and cheese, and, and salsa, and enjoy. And it's also National Advent Calendar Day as we approach the Advent se season. Well, today... On The Brew, we're kicking off November. Uh, it is our focused planning series, and it's also Long-Term Care Awareness Month. And so we're privileged to have uh, one of my colleagues here, Shane Van Patten. Uh, we were just thinking about this. Uh, in June of 2020, uh, 2025, it'll be 20 years since I met Shane. Fresh out of college, uh, he interviewed came and interviewed uh, for a job in our, in our sales area, marketing. Um, and uh, he was fresh from the University of, of Mary, where he was an All-American linebacker. Uh, he, uh, he has more uh, surgeries and injuries to tell you about than anything. But at that point, he was coming off of the gridiron and, and his time as a college athlete. Uh, his neck, his head sitting on his shoulders, there was no neck. I think it just it sat there. He tried to tie a double Windsor knot uh, on his tie for his interview with me. <laughs> and I think his tie came to about here uh, in that interview, Shane. Uh, this, is, but... this is where we always uh, disagree. This is kind of like uh, people who catch a fish up here in Minnesota, right? It keeps getting bigger and bigger over time. And <laughs> in your story, the tie keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Uh, <laughs> but we, we connected in that interview and had the opportunity to share my passion of, of, uh, of the insurance industry, how we help, help people uh, with their financial uh, decisions. Little did we know, Shane, that a few years later that you would, uh, after joining, coming into the insurance business, that your parents would end up in their 60s after your mom's 40 plus year uh, teaching career, uh, that she would start to not know where she was and repeat. And, and you have a story about all of that. But both of your parents went through a long-term care event uh, as we think about Long-Term Care Awareness Month. And uh, the, the, uh, they didn't have a plan in their 60s. They, they weren't prepared for a long-term care event in their lives, nor did they ever have the opportunity to even say no to how to fund a plan, um, whether it was insurance or anything else. And from that, your passion really developed about planning for long-term care. And so we're privileged to have you today to share uh, really your passion, uh, the best practices for integrating long-term care planning into the process for advisors. And you've been coaching financial advisors. You're, you serve on the CLTC, the uh, Certification for Long-Term Care uh, Board, and uh, have, have served on that. And, and you've actually helped them develop courses for this. Mm -hmm. And so I know where your passion comes from, and I'm excited to have you share with us today um, how, how advisors that are listening can add insurance uh, planning into their practice for long-term care. So share with us, Shane. Thank That's you. That's perfect. Well, I appreciate it, Dan. Um, I've seen some of the names kind of popping up here. And uh, for those of you that know me, I could probably talk about the long-term care planning subject for uh, easily two to three hours. Uh, today, we got about 20 minutes. I'm going to try to keep it to about 20 minutes, leave us about five to 10 minutes for questions and answers and things like that. So let me get the uh, screen up here. Dan, can you confirm you can see everything there? I see it. Perfect. Yep. All right. So like I said, we got a lot to uh, to kind of unpack over this 20 minutes. Uh, I do want to make this really, really simple. I've even named the title uh, Making Long-Term Care Planning Simple. Uh, based on my experience, Dan, you mentioned it. I had both my parents in their 60s that needed care. Uh, Mom needed, could have received care. For, she had dementia for about 11 years. My dad uh, needed care for 
about nine months before he passed away. And uh, as you mentioned, I mean, they, they didn't have a plan. And I don't care about the insurance. Step one is we got to create a plan. So today we're going to really kind of go through some simple things that lead up to a plan and how to fund the plan. But really the five steps for successful integration is one, we have to really understand, you know, what is long-term care? When does it start? Because I've talked to a lot of financial professionals. I've talked to a lot of consumers and it doesn't seem to be that there's a, a clear, concise agreement on what a long-term care event is. So step one is kind of getting everybody on the same page. Uh, step two is, you know, once we have that, that fresh mindset of what a long-term care event is, you know, who do we go have a conversation with, right? So helping uh, everybody kind of identify who the ideal client is. Uh, we'll kind of go through, everybody needs a plan. I think if you're 50 or older, everybody needs to have a plan, but I'm going to really kind of shortcut you to who the ideal client is, who's going to be the most engaged in having this type of planning uh, conversation with the professional. Um, and most importantly, how do we create a simple plan of care? And once we have that plan of care, you know, what are the different options we can use to fund the plan? So typically we're going to be looking at Medicare, Medicaid, self-pay, and long-term care insurance. And we'll kind of go through each of that. And then finally, step five, we're going to talk about the best practices for integration. So let's jump right into it. So step one, how, how should we view a long-term care event, right? This is the question that most consumers ask me right away is what is a long-term care event? And really before I can even answer that question, we have to talk about what long-term care is. not So usually I tell them long-term care insurance is not home health care. It's not assisted living. It's not nursing. Long-term care is not insurance, right? Long-term care is simply a disabling event that happens as we age. And if we don't plan for it, it'll have severe consequences to our family's well-being. So most people think of long-term care being a chronic illness or an accident uh, creates it, which can certainly happen. But for most people, it's simply the frailty of aging. And Dan, I know you've heard me say this, but as I define it, the frailty of aging that happens to all of us as we age and the longer we live, the, the more accelerated it gets, but it's the loss of muscle mass, mobility, agility, and balance, right? As we age and we lose those things, it's reasonable to assume that due to the frailty of aging, we might need some standby assistance for a period of years, right? Need some help with some basic living uh, activities for a period of years. And we have to have a plan for that, because if we don't have a plan for that, it's going to go to our default plan, which is having 100% of our assets and our income allocated to pay for it, unplanned for. And we're going to have our spouse and our children and maybe even family and friends that are going to have their health on the line to physically provide care for us, uh, again, unplanned for. So we really need to, to understand it's, it's simply just a disabling event that happens as we age and we must plan for it. Uh, the second topic here, care is initially received at home, not in a nursing home. So if you look at that picture on the screen, you know, you see what most people think of when they think of long-term care event, they think of nursing home, right? You can see the fluorescent lights, the white walls, the, you know, nursing home beds and all that things. But the problem is, is that people aren't active, engaged, and healthy in retirement. And literally the next day, they're flat on their back in a hospital bed in a nursing home, unable to do anything, right? All of a sudden, overnight, they're not in that position, and all of their uh, retirement lifestyle expenses have just dried up and aren't there anymore, and we can use that income to redeploy to pay for this care. And so I ask people all the time, how many people do you know that were active, engaged, and healthy in retirement, and literally the next day they either died or were flat on their back in a nursing home, uh, flat on their back in a hospital bed in a nursing home, unable to do anything. And if they're married, we're expecting that to happen to two people. So I know there's statistics out there that say that, you know, 70% or there's a 70% chance if you make it to age 65 or older, there's a 70% chance that you could uh, need some form of care lasting two to two to four years. That is a motivating statistic for me and encourages me to be proactive about having this planning. But we have to realize that it starts much, much earlier. It starts at somebody being at home, needing help getting out of bed, someone safely to being able to help them take a shower or bath without hurting themselves. 
those individuals still want to go to movies. They want to go to baseball games. They want to travel to go see grandkids, right? All of that still costs money. And it all starts much, much sooner than, than in a nursing home, uh, which kind of goes on to the next uh, tab there is. So we know nurse, uh, care starts at home typically first, progresses into nursing home later, but we really want to protect the family physically and financially while they're at home. And we'll talk about how we can create a plan to do that. But the other thing we have to realize is that all of the retirement lifestyle expenses are still intact, right? I kind of alluded to that person still wants to travel. They still want to spoil grandkids. Uh, it all costs money, right? And this new expense, uh, which is long-term care, also costs money. So we'll talk about that. Uh, financially, long-term care simply creates a, a monthly cash flow issue in retirement. Uh, when I give this presentation and I can see all the people in the crowd, usually I'll say, hey, close your eyes for a moment, right? Picture yourself in retirement and you're living that retirement dream that you and your spouse, you know, really dreamed about and built. You know, you got income coming from Social Security, maybe a pension. You've built a big bucket of money that's now generating income for you. All of that income combined is supporting your lifestyle of your dreams. Now imagine next month you're told that you're going to have a new additional expense of $8,000 a month on top of all your other retirement expenses. Uh, Dan, I know you've heard me say this before, but I sometimes tell people, imagine you're in that retirement next month, you have a new $8,000 a month gym membership in addition to all of your other retirement lifestyle expenses. How are we going to pay for that? So if you see on the screen here, you can see our income and retirement is supporting our retirement lifestyle expenses. But if those expenses jump up by $8,000 a month, how do we cash flow that? Especially if we haven't planned for it. So again, I kind of allude to here on the screen. I apologize. It's on a different screen for me, but how do we, how do we support retirement lifestyle at home and pay for a new expense of $6,000 to $12,000 a month? The answer is we have to plan for it. So now that we're kind of all on the same uh, mindset of you know what long-term care is, where it begins, the monthly cash flow issue in retirement that it creates, uh, we need to do something, right? We need to be proactive and we need to identify who we're going to have this conversation with. Uh, like I said, I think anybody who's 50 or older, no matter what age, no matter what health, no matter what income level or asset level, they need to have a plan. All of them might not qualify for insurance, but they need to have a plan. But if you want to find the people that are going to be most engaged uh, into having this type of planning conversation, I like the clients that are in the retirement red zone. These are clients that are typically between five to 10 years from retirement. Uh, they might be between the ages of 50 and 65. Uh, anybody who has worked with these clients and are doing annual reviews, has anybody noticed if you meet with a client that's within five years from retirement, that they are taking the annual review much more seriously than they ever have before, right? That they're engaged in the review process. And the reason for that is because they're five years from retirement. They see the light at the end of the tunnel. They want to make sure that they are prepared to live the retirement that they dreamt about. Now, most financial professionals I work with uh, that are working with pre-retirees, they have a pre-retirement checklist. And I had a, my father-in-law, He I gave him a, a, a blueprint of about 80 different planning things he could consider. And he ran through and checked everything off as he went through it. Again, he was engaged. He wanted to be prepared to go into the next stage of, of his life, which was retirement. So I encourage people to add the long-term care planning conversation to the pre-retirement checklist. If your client's engaged and it's on the checklist, the conversation has to be had. All right. So with this uh, step one, what I usually do uh, personally, and I've coached a lot of financial professionals to do is go to a CRM that holds all of your clients and pull a list of all your clients that are between the ages of 50 and 65. And once you have that list, the next thing uh, that we're going to do is we're going to put each of those clients into a category. And the three segments or categories I like to use are wealthy, middle class, and Medicaid likely. Again, first thing I'll tell you is every one of these clients need a plan, but the way I am going to communicate with them and the way that I can help them as a financial professional is going to be different. 
So I'll give you an example here. Uh, we'll start with the uh, the bottom, Medicaid Likely. Uh, for me, this is probably a uh, two-spouse couple with maybe an investable net worth of $500,000 or less. Uh, why I believe they probably look like they're Medicaid Likely is it is almost impossible for this family to come up with an additional $8,000 a month in addition to all their other retirement expenses and maintain their lifestyle. Right, so they don't have a long way to spend down before they would qualify for Medicaid. Uh, it, it, it's possible that Medicaid likely, uh, these are Medicaid likely clients, and the way that I can help them is maybe introducing them to a local elder law attorney who can help with, uh, you know, preserving and protecting as much income and assets for the uh, the, the healthier community spouse, and while still understanding the process of how to to do that and still qualify for Medicaid for the for the unhealthy spouse. Now I'll look at the whole other end of the spectrum. It's the wealthy client. Right, the wealthy client can come up with an additional eight thousand dollars a month, and still maintain their family's lifestyle and meet all their commitments. That's not an issue, right? They can come up with the additional money. The conversation I'm having with the wealthy client is that the most mathematically efficient way to pay for care, right? You're paying full dollar for dollar, full retail cost after tax, likely going to liquidate your uh, low yielding, most liquid cash first. Is there some other way that we can fund your long-term care plan more mathematically efficient? Something that would provide leverage, tax efficiency, but most importantly, predictability in funding your plan, right? So the conversation and the, uh, the ways that I can help them are a little bit different. Now, the one that's right in the middle there, this is the one that, that, that really kind of hurts is the middle class. This is the individuals that are, uh, for the most part in the industry are being underserved right now. Right. They, uh, I think of uh, uh, two spouses, uh, we'll say they're 65 years old and they got a million dollars of uh, investable assets. Right? They seem to be, in their minds, doing fantastic. Um, they have a long way to spend down for, for Medicaid. We'll talk about it a little bit later, but I mean, they got you know, almost $845,000 they would have to spend down before they'd qualify for Medicaid. Plus, it would be extremely difficult for this family to come up with even an additional $5,000 a month to pay for a new expense, in addition to all their other retirement expenses. And when you look at the, what's that in a withdrawal rate on a million dollar investment portfolio, where do we come up with an additional 6% in addition to everything else we're taking out and paying for? It's really, really hard for this family. They're not super wealthy, but they're not super poor. These are the individuals that really need a plan and really need to understand their options about uh, how to how to mitigate the consequences to their family. So, and Shane, both of those, the Medicaid likely and the middle class, many times when they have planned, we end up in that conversation. It's crisis. It's crisis planning because one spouse is now needs to go into a memory care facility. Uh, they have this large monthly expenditure now. They're spending down their assets, whether they're middle class or Medicaid likely, both of them enter into crisis mode because they haven't planned. And that's what we see a lot. 100%. And uh, crisis mode is what we're trying to not have happen, right? Uh, being uh, a child of two parents that went through crisis mode, living seven hours away and not knowing what to do, uh, it, it, that's not the way it should happen, right? For any family. And... <clears throat> So even if you have middle class that don't want to do any planning, if they don't want Medicaid likely, especially, I mean, proactively finding an elder law attorney that you're comfortable with, understanding the process, getting guidance as to uh, how you can clean up your record, keeping your books and your accounts, because as you know, Dan, part of Medicaid process <clears throat> is looking back the last five years. Well, if you're in crisis mode and you're trying to all of a sudden find out where things are the last five years and the person who's in crisis can't speak, what do you do? So there's a lot of things that we can still right. do proactively. There's a lot of other professionals that can be involved. It's still going to be a crisis, but there's going to be a plan and everyone involved in the family is going to know what the plan is. And they're going to make that crisis is much, much smaller than uh, kind of what you alluded to. All right. So for me, uh, again, I pull a list of all my clients age 50 to 65. 
And I, once I have that list, I segment them in either wealthy, middle class, or Medicaid likely. That's for me knowing how I'm going to approach them, how we're going to have the conversation, but most importantly, how I can help them. All right. So once I've, uh, once I've identified, you know, I got my list of clients, I know which segment they're in. My goal, my motivation is not to go out and sell insurance, right? My goal is to go out and help them create a plan because once that plan's there, I then have permission to talk about how we're going to fund the plan. And insurance is always going to be one of those solutions. But step one is we have to create a plan and it doesn't have to be even overly uh, deep into the plan. I mean, I use a three part plan for most clients uh, up on the screen. You'll see it. Typical plan is one. I want to make sure that we create a plan that keeps you safe in the comfort of your own home. By doing that, I want to make sure that we protect your spouse and children physically by allowing them to supervise or manage your care. Right? I don't want spouse or family members having to roll up their sleeves and physically provide the care. And then step three is we want to make sure that we protect uh, all the previous financial commitments that were set up for the family. Right? The goal is to make sure that they can maintain lifestyle during this event. So to summarize again, keep you at home, protect spouse and children physically, protect the family's lifestyle financially. That is the plan. How do we do that? So once we have that simple plan created, uh, this is really the education piece to the client is to, well, how, yeah, I mean, most people don't like that. I want to be at home. I want to protect my spouse and children physically and protect them financially. Most people think that's a fantastic plan. This is the hard part, how we're going to actually do it. And we have to give them the education on what could actually fund it. So really you have four choices to consider. Um, you can always put in other category. Um, clients are creative. They'll come up with all sorts of things, but you're in an engaging conversation and it ties back to their plan. Does it fit? But the big four, Medicare, Medicaid, self-pay and long-term care insurance. Uh, we'll go through each of these. So first one is Medicare. Medicare is a health insurance program for individuals 65 or older. Even if you get through all the red tape, which there's a lot, the maximum Medicare will pay for is 100 days, right? That's short-term care. That's not long-term care. And oh, by the way, care is received in a skilled nursing facility, not your home. It doesn't fit the plan that we just created for you, right? Step one of the plan was to keep you safe in the comfort of your own home. This is not a good fit for your plan. Medicaid. Right. This one, uh, this one, you'll get clients that uh, sometimes will get angry, upset. That's not fair, things of that. But this is how it works. Medicaid is a viable solution for clients that don't have any money. The way I like to look at Medicaid is Medicaid is an extremely expensive solution for clients with money. As we kind of talked about in uh, most states uh, will allow the unhealthy spouse to have about two to three thousand dollars. Some states might allow for anywhere from eight thousand to fifteen thousand to prefund a, uh, a final um, a funeral, funeral expenses, things of that nature. But in 2024, the healthy community spouse uh, can have half of all of the assets, not to exceed one hundred fifty-four thousand one forty. So I'm going to go back to that client that we talked about that had a uh, two 65 year olds at a million dollars. They don't care if it's in the husband's name. They don't care if it's in the wife's name. They're going to let the unhealthy spouse will say the husband needs the care. He can have two to $3,000 depending on state. Uh, the remaining 997 to 998,000. Uh, the husband can, of that can keep, uh, or the wife of that can keep 154140 Now, to Dan's point earlier, some elder law attorneys can do some, uh, what we like to call ninja moves to help protect as much income and assets for the, uh, the, the healthy community spouse. But from Medicaid's viewpoint, they need to spend down uh, about $845,000 before the, the husband will qualify for Medicaid. Right. So that just seems like a very expensive solution uh, for them. Uh, the other fun fact that a lot of people don't know is that let's say this uh, husband and wife are on their second marriage with separate children, and they decided to go the route and create a prenuptial agreement. Uh, state Medicaid system, they do not uh, honor 
prenuptial agreements. If you are married, you must combine assets and spend down to the appropriate limits, income asset limits. And this, so, this, this all gets into the testing levels of what is eligible assets and what are ineligible assets. The NIDJA moves, moves some of it into ineligible, but at the end of the day, you're spending down your eligible assets. This is why I try to keep it as simple as possible. Clients, I could go in and go deep, but at the end of the day, it's a viable solution if you don't have any money. Mr. and Mrs. Klein, you have money, so you need to view this as a very expensive solution. Uh, and oh, by the way, the care is received in a skilled nursing facility, not your home. You know, it doesn't fit the plan that we just created. The next one, uh, again, this is everyone's default plan, right? Self-pay, right? Today, if you have a client that don't have any plans, don't have a plan in place, they may or may not have insurance to fund it, but 100% of their assets and income are allocated to pay for care, and their spouse and children are physically on deck to, to provide the care. Uh, this happens every day. Um, I think of uh, like a tornado, right? If you have no plan, the, the people who need care, it's not about them. They get the care. They, it always happens. Everybody who needs care just gets it. It's what happens to everybody around them. So I kind of think of it like a tornado. If you have somebody who needs care and all of a sudden the, the spouse and the children have to physically help out until they can't, and it's financially giving up their whole lifestyle to pay for outside care, that's like an F5 tornado for that family. And right, Shane, having... you, you, you don't allow people to use the word self-insure here, right? There's a, no. you, you're very purposeful about the self-pay. Well, self-insure, you know, assumes two things. One, a transfer of risk, which, which isn't here. You're but taking 100% of the risk. It, correct. The biggest issue is you have no idea what long-term care is going to cost, right? I think I've used this before, but I own my house outright. Uh, I could go get it appraised today find out what it's worth tomorrow. And I could choose whether I want to self-insure my, my homeowner's insurance, right? With long-term care, uh, oh, and with my home, you know, I think there's probably a one to 2% chance that it's going to burn down from a fire or something like that. Uh, the long-term care, I mean, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know if it's going to be in home health care. I don't know if it's going to be assisted living or nursing home, which all have different costs associated with them. Um, I got the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It tells me it's 70%, which you can believe it or not, even if it's 25%. I mean, it's either for me personally, those are averages for me personally and my family and the people around me. It's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. And how do I feel about that? Right. So it's very, is, you're very purposeful about. Correct. Yeah. But with this default plan, again, the only way somebody can really self pay is if they can come up with an additional six to $12,000 a month without disrupting their family's lifestyle. That is the only way. And even if they can do it, then we have to have a conversation. Is that the most mathematically efficient way to pay for care? Considering we're after potentially taxes, market conditions, timing, you know, where are the funds coming from, right? Or, most clients don't liquidate their high yielding investment assets first to pay for care. Instead, they go to their lowest yielding, most liquid cash, which in 20 years from now is probably going to be worth close to the same. Should we consider repositioning some of that to get leverage, to get tax efficiency, and most importantly, to get some predictability to fund the plan? So that kind of goes to the next one. I guess I, I, I went a little fast, long-term care insurance, right? I believe this is the most viable solution for clients that can medically qualify. Why? Because it's cheaper than self-paying, right? That's the leverage. Uh, the benefits are paid out tax advantage, so that's tax efficiency. But most importantly is predictability, right? When I you say investment. LTC insurance, Shane, you're not just talking about the old-fashioned uh, long standalone long-term care policy. You're You're lumping all of that into whether that's annuities, life insurance, a hybrid, care asset rider, based, chronic illness loss, rider, yeah. correct. Yep, I'm putting it into a big pool. Uh, we'll actually talk about that here in a couple of slides. Uh, but this truly is the most viable solutions for clients who can medically qualify for it. And at the end of the day, you know, funding a plan of care, uh, Medicare doesn't fit their plan. Medicaid's expensive and doesn't fit their plan. They really have two options. They can self-pay or they have long-term care insurance. And self-pay, keep all your money, keep all the risk. 
and you have to accept a hundred percent of the consequences to the family. Um, you know, when, when that time comes and the other one's long-term care insurance is, is transferring some of your money in some way, shape or form by doing that, you transfer some of the risk to the insurance company. You know, what you get in return is, uh, like we said, leverage, tax efficiency, predictability, um, but we're actually mitigating some of those consequences to your family, right? We have an earmarked asset that's predictably going to fund our plan of care on a leveraged tax efficient basis. So, now, we just happen to have uh, at E4 Insurance Services here, a proprietary tool called the Long-Term Care Analysis. This is just one page out of the report. I think it's a six page report. Uh, it's really well done. Uh, when I joined E4 in uh, January 1st of 2020 and was introduced to this uh, tool, it was life-changing for me and the advisors I support and ultimately the end clients to be able to understand we have a plan, what are our options to fund it? And as we just came through, really, there's two options. You can use your own money or you can consider insurance. This report does a fantastic job of comparing uh, the blue here, sell fund. So this is creating your own sinking fund uh, to pay for it or comparing the various different types of long-term care insurance. So we have hybrid LTC. This is where you have a, a, a small death benefit, kind of like a cash, cash equivalent, tax-free type return on your money if you never use it. We then have a uh, more bigger life insurance policy with a, uh, a long-term care chronic illness rider added to it. And then we have your traditional standalone long-term care. Uh, this individual, and I won't spend too much time here, but this was a 60-year-old in the state of North Dakota. Uh, we showed an event happening at age 80, lasting four years. So this individual created their plan was very concerned how we're going to fund the plan. They knew they had 20 years until an average type claim at age 80 lasting. They wanted to plan for four years. So what we were able to show them is, all right, if our goal is to have an additional and predictable $10,000 a month at age 80 for four years, how are we going to fund that? How are we going to create that? So the first thing they could do is they could create their own sinking fund, uh, invest it however they want and put 31638 a year for the next 10 years. So the rate of return we use was 3%. This is 3% net of fees, net of taxes. Uh, if there's any financial advisors on here, yes, I know we could do better than 3%, uh, but keep in mind that with a sinking fund for long-term care, we need to have liquidity, which gets us lower yields. We have to have liquidity and predictability that it needs to be there. If we show 7%, it could be down 7%. So. The other thing to keep in mind is that, again, most clients don't liquidate their high yielding investment assets first to pay for care. They go to their lowest yielding, most liquid cash, which is probably less than 3%. So in this case, we chose 3% net. They put in 31,638 each year for 10 years, earn 3% net every year for the next 20 years. This individual would have the predictable $10,000 a month they needed, lasting four years. Fast forward to age 85, they never need care. They're going to leave 582000 to their heirs. So first thing we look at is the hybrid LTC. Uh, you know, instead of creating a sinking fund at 11, 31000 why don't we give the insurance company just under $12,000 a year, right? Almost a third of the cost. And what we get out of that is just pure predictability, right? In the sinking fund, we might not earn 3% net. It's still pretty comfortable, but we might not. With this... You know, we have predictability that uh, we can put in $12,000 roughly each year for the next 10 years, and we will have a guaranteed predictable $10,000 a month lasting for four years. And if we never use it, we'll have $132,000 left over uh, for our heirs. Now, when I can run through this, I got a lot of people that say, well, I really like that $582,000 though in the self-pay option chain, but I don't like the $31,000 uh, that it costs. So a lot of times I'll tell them, hey, why don't we fund the plan with the 12,000 just so we have the predictable tax efficiency asset to, to fund your plan. And if it's important to you to leave money to your children, let's take that other $20,000 that we didn't have to use in the sinking fund. And we can either create an asset and, and invest it much more aggressively, or we could consider life insurance or maybe a combination of both. And that'll be a legacy asset. So as I go through this, um, we walk through the pros and the cons of each. 
the next step is instead of telling a client, Dan, pick, pick out the option you like the best. Based on my experience, I found that clients get paralyzed, par paralysis by analysis. Uh, they don't want to make the wrong decision. So what I like to use is the process of elimination. So even though clients might be hesitant to pick the one they like, they can very easily probably tell you which one they very much dislike. So through the process of elimination, I'll ask Dan, which of these options do you not like? And uh, what we've done is given the client an early win, an easy win. And now we've gone from four options down to three options. And there's momentum there. And we continue to go through the process of elimination before we get down to which of these options they like. Once I go through this executive summary and we found a lane or maybe a couple lanes that they like, it's only at that time that I start bringing out the illustrations and walking them through the product and the details that might work better. Maybe I make some revisions instead of a four years, six years is really more appropriate and comfortable for them. Um, so again, process of elimination. So kind of goes into the best practices for integration. You know, step one, don't lead with illustrations. Illustrations are confusing. Uh, uh, one of my colleagues always says that uh, illustrations were uh, created by attorneys for attorneys, and we stuff them in front of the client's faces, say, what do you like about it or not like about it? Uh, don't get me wrong. Illustrations are important and they are required. Just don't start with them, right? Start with an executive summary and use the process of elimination. Uh, kind of comes down to the next one. When it comes to planning, which mistake would you rather make, right? Create a plan and never have to execute on it or not have a plan and create you know, pure chaos in your family, right? As you mentioned, that crisis mode, you got people that live out of town that physically want to help out or financially the lifestyle's broken. Which, which mistake would you rather make? Uh, would you rather guess or would you rather know? I think it kind of alludes to the same thing. Uh, why I think insurance makes a lot of sense. Would you like to know the ending value today when we're planning for the future? right, with investments, and I think they're great, but the problem is we don't know what they're gonna be worth 10 years from now, we don't know what they're gonna be worth 20 years from now. With insurance, we have that predictability. And when it comes to funding a plan like long-term care, which is probably one of the biggest financial monthly cash flow issues in retirement, we, we ought to consider having some pretty high levels of predictability in funding the plan. So uh, it's kind of the three-step process, education, consideration, implication, right? By providing the client the education, they now have a plan. They understand the things that could help them fund their plan. They've immediately got into consideration, uh, especially to insurance and funding their plan. And uh, for some of the clients, it's going to make sense to, to implement. So it's kind of the process starts with the education, starts with creating the plan. Uh, the other part is if they want to go down the route of insurance, uh, you really have to medically uh, pre-screen your client. You know, there's the saying in the industry that uh, money money pays for insurance, but health buys it. So long-term care is one of those things that uh, we really want to pre-screen, especially the older they are, it's likely they've had more morbidity type issues associated with it. So no, Shane, summary, you've also, you've also, yeah. you, you're a big proponent of, you know, there's other assets too. There's long, you know, even if they're not healthy, that there's annuities today that they can withdraw the money tax free absolutely uh, for, for care there's other they could get leverage even on an annuity basis uh, versus the traditional underwriting for long-term care insurance once we have a plan and we know what's important to them in their plan and we have to fund it if they medically can't qualify i mean there's different levels of medical uh, they might not qualify for this product but they might qualify for this product and to your point I have some people that haven't qualified for any products. And now we do have to use the assets, the income. Uh, I've had people have to consider doing research on reverse mortgages to come up with the additional liquidity needed to pay the monthly cash flow issue in retirement called long-term care. So it, it uh, plans there and allows you to proactively still get creative and provide value to, to the, those clients and their family members. So, uh, well, so, we do have one question, Shane, that came up. Uh, this executive white paper, um, the the long term care analysis. How how does an advisor uh, engage in that with E four to, to pick that up? Sure, uh, I would say reach out to uh, 
to your regional vice president, your RVP, uh, if you don't have one. Um, I think there'll be a telephone number at the end of my slide here, or you can just go to our website and just call into the main office and somebody will certainly help you. Um, when, when it looks at, uh, I mean, ideally it works really good for clients between the ages of 50 to 70, sometimes over age 70. There's just not enough products that are available. And we have such a short time frame because we're using that report with the event starting at age 80. Doesn't mean there's not available solutions, uh, but really 50 to 70, I think, is where this report fits really, really good. Um, for me personally, when I look at uh, product selection or how we're putting in, it's really a two funnel approach. It's uh, you can tell me the client's health and you can tell me their wealth and specifically what's made up of that wealth. Uh, if I know the client's health and their source of funds of what I think would likely be the most appropriate to pay or reposition, I can take a whole industry of different products and types of products and usually narrow it down to one or two. Um, but I think the long-term care analysis is the most unbiased overview of here's your real options and what they would cost to get to that goal of trying to offset home health care or uh, cost of care for four years at May JD to 84. It's Great. a long, long answer, but <laughs> um, in summary, and insurance isn't the plan, insurance funds the plan. So we must create the plan first. Um, you know, once we have this information, what do we do now, right? Uh, do the right things for your client, create a plan. It really starts with identify your clients 50 to 65, have that list and have them segmented. Are they wealthy? Are they middle class? Are they Medicaid likely? Uh, with that, reach out to your RVP and we can really help build out different long-term care analysis form, help you how to get into the conversation, create that curiosity. Uh, by doing this planning, again, it protects assets under management, it drives additional revenue, and it really does create uh, competitive immunity. You know, I had a, uh, every time I see this, it makes me think of him, he's passed away, but I had a business coach who used to say, uh, your clients are someone else's perspective clients. So if we're not proactively having these conversations with the clients, helping them create the plan, come up with ways to fund the plan, it opens the door and gives the opportunity for another advisor to, to have that conversation and potentially, you know, pick up a new client for them. So be proactive, uh, identify, we have here the top three prospects, but really if you got that list of 50 to 65 and you know where they're at, we can help you uh, talk about each of those clients and how you can help them, how we can have a conversation. So. Well, great. Uh, if there's any questions, we we welcome them at this time. Shane, I really appreciate the uh, the sharing that you uh, you did. Obviously, uh, just in our initial comments, your passion for having gone through this and seen uh, the firsthand the impact to the family, uh, the the non the non the, the stay at home spouse and the impact to them, and providing this care, the impact to you. Um, being seven hours away and how, how that impacted your life. And uh, it's just your passion and, and your, your ability to communicate. This is really a testament uh, to, a, to, to what you've been through. And, and uh, I, I, I welcome anybody to call you uh, and ask you any questions on how best to position this. Cause you really are a world of knowledge on this. Yeah, absolutely. I think well, uh, we need to uh, have a giveaway here of a, a Star Starbucks gift card and a CE voucher. I need a number between one and 32, Shane. Well, being it's my birthday month, I'm going to choose the 11th. So 11. Lucky 11. 11. 11. The winner today, 11, is Kira, uh, Kira Moore. And uh, you'll be receiving a note from us. And congratulations. We'll be in touch. Uh, wow. Wow. Thank you. You're welcome. I was going to say, I know that. Kiera, so that's <laughs> Hi, fantastic. Shane. Hi, Kiera. <laughs> hey. Well, thank you, Kiera, for being on today and being our winner. Um, as your Thanks clients get closer, me. you're welcome. As your clients get closer and closer to retirement, the conversation changes from accumulation to needs, wants, and concerns, and they say goodbye to the eight to five. Next week, Jeremy Vidmar, our FICCLTC, uh, E4 Regional VP, will jump in 
was a unique case study to show you how to create a plan that guarantees your client's needs, wants, and concerns are met. Again, that will be focused in Long-Term Care Awareness Month. So be sure to join us next week on The Brew. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week.